Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to the session on the question, will biosimilars change the treatment paradigm in psoriasis? My name is Matthias Augustin. I am the chair, and I also welcome my co-chairs, Martin Schiesel and Sascha Gerdes. Uh, we are intent to inform you on the very current knowledge and development regarding this exciting time uh, to have biosimilars in the market, in the use uh, for psoriasis and other dermatologic conditions. Before going deeply into this topic, let me just summarize uh, the program that we have. First of all, uh, uh, focusing on the evolving role of systemic therapy in psoriasis, which is quite new for us as dermatologists in the past decade. Uh, then uh, the analytical comparison as the foundation of biosimilarity by Martin Schiesel and uh, then uh, by Sascha Gerdes, uh, the demonstration of clinical equivalence with data which you surely have not seen yet, and we are very looking much forward, Sascha, to your presentation. And finally, a panel discussion, which also means that we will not discuss the single presentations, but uh, with an overview at the end. Well, uh, housekeeping uh, as usual, uh, you uh, know this, and regarding uh, the uh, First topic, evolving role of systemic therapy in psoriasis. Uh, my disclosures, uh, we are working with a lot of companies like uh, most of us and doing good research. Uh, and now come, let's come to the topic. Uh, we all being in somewhere in Europe know uh, that psoriasis is a key disease for us. Uh, we are a population in Europe of roughly 600 million. You know that the weighted prevalence across Europe of psoriasis is 2.5%, which means that we have almost uh, 15 million patients in Europe to treat with psoriasis, something like 20 to 25% with severe disease. This makes up a population is, uh, uh, of the Netherlands, as if all people from the Netherlands would have psoriasis. So it's a considerable number of uh, men, uh, people we are responsible for. Uh, the need for such a treatment, the need for early treatment and early health care has been already emphasized by the European White Paper on psoriasis with a framework for improving the quality of care for the people with psoriasis and a psoriasis mandate which was submitted to the European Union. And one of the key um, elements of this was uh, the statement that there's a need to improve access to systemic treatments for psoriasis in Europe. Access is a problem, not the, the availability of the drugs. And you may all know the uh, psoriasis global report, which was prepared in 2015 based on the WHO uh, resolution on psoriasis in 2014. And if you look into this global report, you will find this sentence saying, patients suffering from psoriasis should have access to comprehensive, individually adapted treatment. The second one, for newer biological therapies, more needs to be done to reduce the price of these medicines if they are to present a sustainable and affordable treatment option for patients with psoriasis. In other words, we also need to seek not just to make use of these modern drugs, but also uh, to uh, get uh, affordable prices for these drugs, and this is the topic today. Um, this new option to treat with biologics is not, and also with systemics, is not uh, taken over by all dermatologists. And you see here a graph which depicts that in different countries in Europe, the rate of, the proportion of dermatologists prescribing uh, by systemic antiseretics is very different. In some countries, it's done by almost all dermatologists, especially in those who have a gatekeeping system with few dermatologists doing mostly uh, work on severe diseases, and many others uh, don't uh, do uh, prescriptions for systemic applications. And one reason for this is that also the allocation of biologics and the uh, regulation of the use is different in the countries, with some countries where only hospitals can or even in some countries, uh, biologics cannot even be prescribed by dermatologists. Regarding uh, the framework of uh, prescriptions, uh, also the budgets are important, and in some countries there are no fixed budgets, in others there are national budgets or even hospital ones or regional ones. So uh, you again see uh, that uh, the use of drugs also depends on the health system, and finally, in some countries, uh, the decision for using biologics is just based on the dermatologist's judgments. In other, there needs to be a second opinion or even approval by payer. So in some countries, we as dermatologists are not as free as we might want to be. As a conclusion, psoriasis healthcare in Europe is very heterogeneous and there's a central role to date 
uh, for systemic therapy in all countries. Now, uh, in my talk, I will uh, focus on the evolving role of this systemic therapy in psoriasis. I will start with the question uh, how they have changed our landscape, and you will surely find yourself in that. Because we have passed a decade that changed psoriasis care in most countries, and this was driven by uh, the development of new technology. Here you see uh, those many drugs which were coming up just in the past uh, 10 years or 12 years, and at the same time, we needed to react, we needed to define where to use them, uh, we needed to have a, 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 a guideline for this, we needed to look on the safety of the new drugs here with the registry in many countries, uh, we needed to consent on the treatment goals for this uh, uh, new uh, area here, and we needed also to implement now by similars uh, which were coming up last year. Overall, uh, there has been a need to, to better reflect what we are doing in healthcare for this important disease. And now, if you look into the future, there are still challenges because there are new upcoming components uh, that you know, and there has been more work on biosimilars, and we expect biosimilars for the next drugs uh, now and in the future. Overall, <clears throat> there will not be a single year which has the same constitution of drugs in the markets than the year before. So it's very dynamic and this is good. At least it's good for the patients, but it's a, a nightmare for people who are writing guidelines like myself, because you need to rewrite the guideline every year as well and you don't come along with the work on this. Now, a second point, which are the needs? What defines the needs for treatment? Surely it's the patient burden and we decide to use systemics and biologics based on uh, what patients suffer from the disease. This is well known, but we can also measure this. And I make this point because it's not just one single need that patients have, but when we look into many patients, it's a variety of needs. And I explained this to you because it may not be very well to read in the back. Uh, if you ask many patients, we did so with uh, about 4,000 patients in Germany, most of them say they want to get better skin quickly, but many also say they, wa they want to regain control of the disease, uh, be free of itching, uh, need less time for daily treatment, and many more feel less depressed. And so uh, the, there's one goal and one desire from the patient side, which is reflected by PASI, get better skin quickly, uh, resolution of the skin lesions, and many, many more are beyond PASI, which we cannot measure with this outcome. But we have to ask the patients, and we have to draw individual lines uh, of patient benefits and goals. Which is our potential? Can we address and meet the needs of the patients? Clearly, yes because we are in the happy situation, unlike our fathers in dermatology, to have drugs that really work, and they work uh, effectively and rapidly in many patients. So uh, basically, it's a good time for us as dermatologists and for the patients uh, to get such an improvement to meet the needs early on. And also, we uh, have a much broader variety of drugs available. Uh, this depicts uh, the drugs available for psoriasis and arthritis in 2004. This should be, not 14, 2004. And this is uh, what uh, we have now. Many more drugs on both levels for psoriasis and for arthritis. So the spectrum also is there uh, to help people with systemic treatment. And we have guidelines uh, like the uh, EDF guideline on a European level, which clearly regulate that, of course, uh, we need uh, topical drugs for mild disease, but then uh, for moderate to severe disease, there's uh, just two options, UV treatment uh, or systemic therapy, in some cases, of course, plus topical therapy. And you all know that in the field of systemic treatment, we have first and second line drugs. And now the barriers or the frontiers between the conventionals and the biologics are mixing up because sicokinumab has first line labeled it, Ilumab also now. And uh, so again, uh, there is a large variety of options when we do systemic treatment for psoriasis. The current state of guidelines in Europe is as follows. There are plenty of uh, systemic treatment options uh, offered. Sicokinumab and Aprimlist are not yet included, and there's no clear evidence at the moment for which drug to start with, which systemic drug. Uh, uh, even in countries uh, where there's just a few options, um, it's not clearly regulated. Also, uh, the switch of biologics and the starting point uh, in most countries is open for us, and this is good, basically. We know uh, that once there's limited access to drugs, 
uh, there is uh, less treatment success. And this is depicted by a study from the United States between public and, and private insurance. And here you see uh, the level of prescriptions, but differences uh, in the uh, maximum outcomes regarding BSA and PGA uh, in favor of uh, those uh, insured who had public insurance and who had larger access to the drugs they needed. So a narrow uh, spectrum of drugs obviously is not as good uh, for patient outcomes. Now what about the selection of systemics? There are several uh, uh, criteria. One of course is the clinical picture. Uh, one is uh, the drug characteristics. We want to take the drug of choice which best fits the patient needs and the disease uh, severity. Uh, there are the patient characteristics, preferences of the patient, and also legal, legal issues because in some countries um, the authorities want to follow a certain line of treatments. Otherwise, uh, we need to follow these four ones, and each of them still has a, a lot of considerations that you're all aware about. But uh, systemic treatment for psoriasis is not an easy thing. You need to have uh, expertise, you need to be courageous enough to do so, and finally, it's also about experience. Regarding uh, the treatment goals, uh, there is a European consensus that it makes sense uh, to uh, define goals for systemic treatment. And you uh, probably know uh, the consensus uh, with this scheme uh, published by Uli Mowitz and many colleagues from all over Europe, indicating that we look at both outcomes. We want to reach a good uh, objective improvement of psoriasis by systemic treatment uh, measured by PASI, or uh, could also be PGA, but I think PASI is more appropriate. And on the second level, we also want uh, to include the patient perception in that uh, defining also a, a need for change and for improvement, for modification, uh, when a certain level of quality of life improvement has not been reached. And this uh, methodology has now been kept into many guidelines as well, and I think most of you follow this. However, there may be some discussions on uh, which is uh, the goal to reach it. If you uh, follow the consensus as it is now, the goal uh, of any treatment is defined to be complete clearing of lesions, which is uh, PASI greater than 90 or uh, PGA01. And uh, this would mean that um, this is not a good goal, PASI 75 or PASI 50. And in reality, in your practice, you probably come across patients who are fine with this and who say, well, I've reached so much, I'm so happy, well, why achieve more, why change a drug, uh, I'm, I'm okay with this. At least this happens in my practice. And so uh, it must not be a complete clearance or almost complete clearance. My opinion is that the goal of any treatment needs to be agreed with the patient in systemic therapy. How do PASI and DQI relate to patient benefits? Do patients really or is, is their uh, need reflected by those two? Uh, in a way, it is. And I show you uh, data uh, which compare uh, the PASI responses here from the German registry uh, with some thousand patients. And we asked anchor questions. Uh, this one was, are you uh, satisfied with your treatment? Is it OK for you, uh, what, what we have reached? And you can see here the degree of satisfaction, saying, yes, this is the treatment I wished. Uh, of course, is linear uh, with increasing PASI, but um, there is no difference here between PASI 90 and 100, and some patients just using PASI 50 or 75 still think that uh, it's okay. And if we ask, uh, have the all skin lesions healed again, there is a linear uh, relationship, and again, almost no difference between PASI 90 and 100, re again, reflecting that the patient do not differentiate between them but you can also see that this has not reached 100%. So patients reaching complete clearance defined by PASI may still think that they have some lesions, and this is a 20%, due, maybe, maybe due to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So in practice, uh, these are the areas where we, we drive our decision and where we consider whether to change treatment or not. The same association can be seen between PASI and DOQI, again, this reflects uh, PASI responses, 9100, and the proportion of patients reaching uh, DOQI01, which is uh, the most common goal. And again, you can see PASI 9100, no difference. And again, there are patients who just reach PASI 50, but have a, a good DLQI. Again, this uh, makes us uh, be more differentiated than just looking at PASI in our decision making. So finally, 
the conclusion we should not fix on PASI 100. PASI 90 and 100 are uh, equally good indicators of drug performance, but clinical decisions are made between PASI 50, 75, 90 for most of us, I would say, but we can discuss this later. Last point on uh, the management of systemic treatment uh, regarding a, a definition of moderate to severe psoriasis. In this consensus document I have mentioned by Uli Movitz and colleagues, uh, there was clear emphasis uh, on the point uh, that some patients who not reach PASI 10 still have or even have uh, a severe disease. And uh, this is defined in cases where there is involvement of visible areas like here major parts of the scalp uh, or treatment refractory areas. And you will surely agree that patients who have such a nail disease exclusively may not just treat more than PASI 1 or 2, so they are not severe by definition PASI 10 and more, uh, but they surely suffer such a lot uh, that we need to treat them systemically. And this is a, a wise decision which also reflects uh, the way we treat and uh, practice. When should we start using systemic treatments? Uh, now the answer is as early as needed or as early as possible and we should not miss the point when there is a need of the patient. And this is uh, uh, reflected in the scheme. If we do early intervention we can avoid an increase and an escalation of disease uh, with late intervention and we can avoid a corridor and a range of higher morbidity and costs here. So uh, we should not miss this point uh, because we can then save patients from having accumulated life cause impairment, missed opportunities, escalation of comorbidity and suffering. And in arthritis we know that we should not miss it because there could be sustained bone damage, irreversible bone damage. Now, uh, what about drug safety and systemic treatment? You all know about this and uh, you know uh, that uh, we need to care for patients for decades. This is the uh, frequency of psoriasis, uh, at least in Germany, with some thousand patients. And uh, you can see it's age dependent and the average lifetime period of psoriasis is more than 40 years which means that in those patients with moderate to severe disease, we need to reflect uh, what this means to have disease uh, for su such a long period of time. And in children, uh, the expected lifetime with psoriasis is more than 60 years. So any treatment decision needs to be careful and cautious regarding long-term outcomes. And uh, to do so, to, to get more data, in many countries in Europe there have been uh, de de established uh, psoriasis registries uh, like data from this one in Spain. Uh, and these data indicate uh, that uh, the level of safety of, of systemic treatment and biologic treatment in general is high because we as dermatologists are cautious with the drugs. But they also indicate uh, that there are patients which we do not see in clinical trials that have an elevated risk for side effects and for adverse events. And uh, this is depicted here. Uh, in this um, registry, uh, the authors, Garcia uh, Doval and colleagues, have uh, differentiated between patients of the registry uh, which uh, were exposed, um, uh, which were, were, have been ex um, 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 in, to be included into uh, clinical trials or not. And um, they found out that the, well, it's not depicted here, sorry. Uh, they found out that those patients who would not have been eligible for clinical trials had much higher rates of side effects. So the conclusion is uh, that safety in real world may differ from RCT, or as RCT suggests, and pharmacovigilance by psoriasis registries is essential for patient safety. Um, so, this is why we are so dependent on the data from uh, the SONET, uh, the European uh, Psoriasis Network, uh, with registries coming from many countries uh, across Europe. I have to admit that Australia is not part of Europe, but they are also affiliated, uh, like Israel is here as well. And these data are uh, our con uh, or continuous source uh, for estimating uh, the safety of our drugs beyond the registries. So uh, one example of such a registry is uh, the German registry SOBEST, uh, which um, identifies all risks of patients with systemic therapy and biologics. And here you see uh, an analysis of this with many uh, system organ classes. And it's hard to read if you don't uh, lie on the left side. But uh, I summarize for you. This indicates uh, problems like uh, GI tract uh, side effects, psychiatric side effects, neurological ones, and so on. 
And on one view, you can see uh, that uh, there is no difference in severe adverse events between patients receiving biologics and systemics because uh, the uh, um, confidence intervals overlap. So uh, this means uh, that in general, of course, there is a average risk of drugs uh, for side effects, even for severe adverse events, uh, but not at an increased level between biologics and systemics. And these events are as expected in these age groups because they also include uh, the normal uh, frequency of uh, those events uh, among non-suriatics. Now, let's come to, to the question about the access to treatment. Who has the chance to get treatment? Uh, and if you see this, this is a study uh, published by Mark Lebwohl and many of our colleagues uh, in the Blue Journal. If you see this, uh, you can get very pessimistic about uh, our health care in, in all countries included. This is from five countries because uh, they uh, asked by phone interviews thousands of patients per country about uh, their access to drug treatment. And you can see here uh, the um, degree of severity, which by foam could just be depicted by palm, the number of palms affected from psoriasis. This is mild disease, uh, moderate disease, and this is severe disease. And there's almost no difference between patients regarding uh, the use of topicals. And even if you focus on the severe disease, 37% uh, of patients with severe disease didn't have treatment at all. And uh, these just got topical treatment. Uh, this was oral and uh, this was oral and biologic. Uh, actually, the colors here are not, not the right ones. So in other words, uh, more than 80% of patients with severe disease uh, did not get uh, systemic treatment as they would have uh, deserved. It's a little better with psoriatic arthritis patients, but still uh, many don't get uh, systemic treatment at all, which uh, of course, as you know, can be a disaster later. So if uh, we consider this, uh, we should know that uh, there is a big, big iceberg uh, with many patients, much more than we treat with systemic treatments, who have not yet got access uh, to these drugs. So if we look at healthcare and systemic therapy in, op in Europe, it's like a glass is uh, half full and half empty. We can uh, be proud on uh, those dermatologists in many countries who do a good job, who treat the patients according to guidelines and according to the needs of the patients. Uh, but some patients, for re many reasons, do not get access to what they deserve and what they should have uh, received. And uh, we are in the process in, in many countries to identify the barriers for systemic therapy in Europe. And basically, they can be found on three sides. And this is my final consideration for you. Uh, it's not just uh, that physicians do not do uh, the job as they should be, but also uh, there are many patients who uh, are misinformed, who have uh, concepts about the risks of systemic treatment, who just don't want to. And we need to inform them about uh, the m many benefits it has. And of course, there are also the external factors. And all these three ones have been included uh, in a scheme which we published on barriers in Europe. Uh, you refined uh, the patient view, uh, the physician view, and external factors preventing or facilitating uh, the use of systemic treatment as indicated by guidelines. I don't have to can into, go into detail, but uh, just one example uh, regarding external factors. There are countries where there's a very strict limitation of numbers of uh, patients getting systemic treatments, which is a negative factor here. And in other countries, uh, there is at least a free access to those uh, who qualify uh, by the d d degree of severity. How can these barriers be overcome? One, we need to implement the standardized uh, regular screening for uh, patients and for their needs. We need to understand the needs. We need to incorporate uh, comorbidity screening into uh, our doing. And we need to involve patient advocacy groups in guideline development so that they can uh, insist on those points which they found uh, uh, particularly important. Uh, we should acknowledge uh, the financial implications of treating a complex disease and the authorities should do so, the payers, because it's not as easy treating a patient with systemic uh, disease uh, than with just small spots which we can easily treat topically. And finally, we need to increase awareness of psoriasis and the different treatment options 
among decision makers. And I just came back uh, when I arrived here from a meeting with uh, the, the International Global Alliance of Patient Organizations who met with the WHO again on the global report. And it's uh, uh, for sure it's important to continuously raise awareness uh, in the decision makers because they don't uh, take it for granted uh, that psoriasis needs to be treated properly and uh, with systemic drugs. Which are the chances for systemic therapy in Europe? Surely uh, there's a chance and there's a perspective uh, by, uh, the, uh, by similars uh, coming up as approved by logics. I don't go into detail with this because this is the, the topic of Martin Schiesel in the uh, next presentation. Uh, but for sure, uh, there is an increasing number of biologics in the market and more are to be expected by many companies in different stages of approval and uh, they will be aware not everywhere, but everywhere where they need, we need them. And these biosimilars have been shown to uh, drop prices for drugs and expenses. And here you see a uh, overall scheme which depicts that uh, with the upcoming biosimilars for another indication, a uh, in Germany, uh, though there was an increase in overall use, uh, the costs uh, really shrank of, uh, to almost half of the cost uh, between 2007 and 2011, just because there was a pressure on prices and a, a, a better payment system. Also, there's a high cost-saving potential of biosimilars for psoriasis or uh, for uh, other chronic inflammatory diseases, and this has been estimated in a recent publication in Value of Health by health economists, and the estimated savings, of course, depend on the uh, use of the drug uh, as available, but you see there is a certain potential uh, which uh, needs to be discussed. Regarding uh, the chances and uh, the innovation character of biosimilars, uh, it's for sure uh, that uh, we uh, need to discuss uh, how many patients we can treat more uh, if they come into the market. It's not one by one, as we know, uh, but there is a potential for that. Uh, we could then treat patients earlier, help uh, uh, the uh, access to drugs, uh, help reduce healthcare funding deficits and delays in starting therapy. But this is still theory because we don't have the data, uh, at least not for psoriasis, uh, but it's a potential that we could use uh, if we want to. So my conclusions um, regarding systemic therapy. First of all, there's a variety of effective systemic treatments options for moderate to severe psoriasis. Even those who are not as effective on the first uh, look may be of value and potential because they may uh, be um, easier to handle or uh, they may be second, third choice uh, once the others fail. So the variety is, I think, very good. There's clear evidence to start systemic treatment early. Uh, the biologic treatment changed landscape of psoriasis care and by itself provides added value, I've shown you quickly. There's no clear evidence about optimum treatment pathways and long-term management. Uh, we are still very free in that because um, the evidence for uh, the line of drugs is not there. Uh, but uh, we can choose by clinical pattern drug properties and patient preferences. And there's a large evidence uh, from the registries in now 15 European countries with more than 40,000 patients observed on the long run. Uh, for real-world uh, drug safety and systemic treatment. And we need to and we can remove barriers by creating awareness, expert knowledge, that's why we're here, uh, by optimizing the prices and use the potential of biosimilars. This is a view on my hometown, Hamburg, and with this, I thank you for your attention. So, so good afternoon, everybody. It is now my pleasure to talk about the biosimilar concept and the foundation of biosimilarity, which is the analytical comparison. And I'm Martin Schistel, I'm a Chief Science Officer for Sandus Biopharmaceuticals, and within, in, within Sandus, I've been working now on the development of these biosimilar products since 20 years. So I started in 1996, at a time when there was no regulatory pathway for these products available. We only knew that science allowed to make these type of products, and also that we have the capabilities to do that. And this vision became a reality in uh, 2006 with the first approval of a biosimilar in Europe. So we can now look back at 10 years of clinical experience with biosimilar products on the marketplace in Europe. And uh, what we have seen up to now is that these products exactly behave as, they, um, as expected. 
So, but to st start my presentation, I would like to focus a little bit on the biosimilar concept, because although we have now a vast experience with developing those products and also 10 years of market experience, it is still a new thing for many people. And it is really a paradigm shift when we compare biosimilar development with the development of originator molecules. And this is illustrated here on this slide. On the left side, you see uh, the originator development. And here, the main scientific question to answer is, um, is a certain molecule active in a patient? Can it provide a benefit? What is the safety and efficacy? So therefore, certainly analytical characterization is important to describe the product and the manufacturing process to make it consistently. But for the approval, the real decisive uh, question is, what is the clinical evidence? So therefore, the clinical or the originated development is so much focused on those, uh, on the generation of this clinical evidence. And it has to be shown and demonstrated in each and every indication. Now, when we move to the biosimilar development, here the goal is a totally different one. Here we try to establish uh, a product which is essentially the same as the originator so that we can leverage the clinical experience established by the originator also for the biosimilar. So in other words, we need to show that these products are comparable uh, at all levels. And the most sensitive tools to show this degree of sameness or comparability are the analytical methods. So therefore, the analytical development or the biosimilar development is founded on this head-to-head -head comparison of the molecules on the analytical level. Then we do also head-to-head -head studies in the preclinical and clinical uh, arena. And also here, the studies are focused to demonstrate whether there are differences or in the other direction, whether they are truly the same. And therefore, the clinical trials for biosimilar development may also look slightly different than trials used in an originated development. But this, uh, an example of this we will hear in the next presentation by Sascha Gerdes. Now, coming to the definition of biosimilar, I think it's also important to revisit uh, what is, in effect, a biosimilar. Certainly, it is a successor to a biologic that has lost exclusivity, for example, when patent has expired. Uh, then, a biosimilar needs to match the reference biologic or the originator in all relevant features. And this is important, and this is also clarification. Um, the European Commission made a few years ago which states very clearly that physicians and patients can expect the same safety and efficacy uh, profile. So this is the regulatory expectation to a biosimilar. If there is any doubt that a product will behave differently, it won't get uh, approved as a biosimilar product. And it's also important to note that biosimilar or highly similar, that these are regulatory terms uh, to refer to a biologic that has been approved by a stringent biosimilar pathway. So it is, in fact, only a label for a certain regulatory pathway. It is not so much a scientific term in the sense, yeah, these are similar or these are not identical or so what, because in, in this context, the term similar has also raised a lot of confusion and concerns in the sense that, yeah, there might be some differences and we don't know about that. No, this is not the case. The term similar, biosimilar is only a label for this regulatory pathway. And uh, the, uh, in, in fact, uh, for the patient, uh, there is no difference whether treated with a biosimilar or an originator drug. And also the European Commission made an additional clarification also for the active ingredient, which is also s s um, mentioned in the Q&As, that this is essentially the same substance as in the uh, originator product. Now, how uh, similar, using this regulatory term, is a biosimilar uh, with regard to the biochemical structure? So when we look at the first point, the amino acid sequence, here there is a very clear regulatory requirement, namely, this needs to be identical. So when we look at a monoclonal antibody, which has about yeah, 1,300 amino acids, if there is only one amino acid different, it won't get approved as a biosimilar product. Then the folding of the three-dimensional structure, this needs also be the same or in analytical terms, uh, indistinguishable. 
because as you know, proteins, they act also via their three-dimensional structure like a key that is fitting precisely into its keyhole. So if the folding is a different one, this interaction won't happen and there would be a functional difference. And again, this would preclude this product from being a biosimilar. Then uh, when we look at glycosylation, and here you see for an antibody, the red piece here, don't see it. Uh, so, so this is the, the glycan moiety here um, of an IgG1 antibody. And here, um, uh, this is, um, here we need to have identical glycanes in comparable amounts. And all, only here are differences are acceptable if uh, a company can demonstrate convincingly that these differences don't lead to any significant impact for the patient. And here, um, this is also a point where we see variability in these type of products. So what you see here are analytical data from originator molecules, uh, where we tested different batches we bought from the market and uh, analyzed them by all means. And the upper graph on the right side shows the amount of a certain sugar in a monoclonal antibody, and you see how variable this amount is, or you see a certain degree of variability, to put it in the right context. Um, so you can distinguish each and every batch which is manufactured from the other one by analytical methods. And on the lower side you see, uh, these are data for, from the originator rituximab, where we also see here a certain degree of batch-to-batch uh, -batch variability, which is a normal fact uh, for all pharmaceutical products. What you see here in addition on the right lower side, uh, also this depicts uh, the amount of a certain sugar of different batches that at a certain time point, there was a shift. And this shift was indicative uh, for a situation where the manufacturer, the originator, changed the manufacturing process of this product. So for us working in a biological industry, this is nothing unusual. This is our daily life. It's uh, clear that these products um, are, uh, show a certain degree of variability. What is important is that this degree of variability is controlled within tight uh, margins to ensure that the product, um, so, so to ensure that all batches within the variability have the same clinical properties for the patient. And also when a manufacturer is doing a manufacturing process change, then the manufacturer has to show that the product after the change and before the change um, are the same with regard to the uh, clinical properties. Otherwise, regulatory agencies wouldn't approve a manufacturing change. And when we go to the next slide, you see that manufacturing processes are changed quite um, frequently. You see here a number of changes of certain uh, products used or biological products used in the immunolo immunology arena. And uh, these changes can be very small, but also large changes happen. For example, if a new purification method is included or if a new manufacturing site uh, is uh, established. And all these changes need to be regulated since early times, since early on in the biotech industry. And uh, nowadays these changes are well understood and tightly controlled uh, by international guidelines. And uh, again, a change is only approved when the company can demonstrate that the product will uh, have the same clinical properties after the change. Even though maybe analytically you can detect that there was a change and you see a, a difference in, in, in some byproducts or impurities. And the biosimilar concept, in fact, uh, was developed by the uh, experience with those manufacturing changes. You see here also the timelines for the regulation of manufacturing changes. So the big concepts have been finalized at the end of the 90s, and uh, we have now these international guidelines uh, established since 2004, which is still valid. And in the same time, same year, also the uh, um, uh, European Union established the, the legal basis for biosimilar um, approval. And um, it was uh, followed by the guidelines and, and the first products right after. So the point is that in both situations, uh, scientifically, you have the same question. You have two versions of a product and you have to demonstrate whether these two versions have the same clinical properties. So the scientific principles are the same. Therefore, we can say that for a patient it's no difference whether a patient receives the next batch of an originator or the next batch of a biosimilar. The scientific concepts and the regulatory standards are the same 
uh, for all biological products on the market. In the next slide, I will show you some data for um, GB2015, which is the code name for our biosimilar candidate for e uh, And as you know, this is um, a uh, dimeric fusion protein, which uh, consists of the receptor portion of a TNF-alpha receptor linked to the FC part of an antibody. And the mechanism of action is competitive inhibition of soluble TNF-alpha. And this product is used in uh, different indications and uh, we set up our development program also to enable the extrapolation uh, of indication. So extrapolation of indication in the biosimilar context means um, uh, to make um, a biosimilar product and then uh, to check whether this data package allows the use of other indications of the originator also for the biosimilar. And this is also a concept which is uh, debated quite intensively. And I would like to introduce this with a fundamental thought, which is the basis for the extrapolation. And that is that if you have the same molecule, it's very logical that it will behave the same way in all different indications. So therefore, when we extrapolate uh, for a biosimilar, uh, this is done from product to product. So by demonstrating this degree of sameness, this data is used to evaluate whether extrapolation is possible or not. And extrapolation is not simply from the clinical data alone to the reference product indications, because as you know, um, products which uh, prove to be effective in psoriasis don't need to be effective also in rheumatoid arthritis. You cannot deduce this from the uh, clinical data alone. Uh, but if you realize that this in a biosimilar development that the, uh, we did a psoriasis study and that this psoriasis study is only the final piece of the overall totality of evidence in demonstrating that these two products are in fact essentially the same, then uh, it is possible to extrapolate to other indications of the reference product. So, uh, and uh, when we also look back to the manufacturing changes, so uh, it is also used, or the concept of extrapolation is also used uh, when manufacturing process changes are regulated. So here you see the uh, data from, uh, from Embrel, from the originator. Um, also uh, the amount of G2F uh, um, uh, sugar content. And uh, each dot here represents the value of, uh, of one batch. Also here you see the batch to batch variability and also in the, in the later part, um, a second population, which was also indicated for a larger manufacturing change of the originator. And also in this case, the company demonstrated to the agencies that these products are um, the same with regard to the patient treatment. So therefore it was approved for all indications and it was also extrapolated. This data package was extrapolated to all indications. And therefore this change was approved. And this type of extrapolation, uh, the discussion happened um, normal, always only between the agencies and the, and the companies. So it wasn't debated in the, in the medical community. It's different in the biosimilars. But I would like to bring this example to demonstrate that the regulatory standards when regulating manufacturing changes or regulating biosimilars are truly the same. So to conclude the extrapolation piece, what we do, we um, do head-to-head -head studies uh, of the structural features of the products. We test all the biological functions. We do human pharmacokinetics and PD. And we have then uh, the clinical data confirmation or the, cl the clinical confirmation in sensitive indication. And all these uh, data are put together uh, to evaluate whether another indication of the reference product can be used for the biosimilar. Now, f finally, I will just uh, show you also some analytical data of our development. And with regard to analytics, I already said that these are very powerful tools and we can compare products very, um, very nicely to, um, to a high level of detail. And uh, the reason why we can do this is because these methods have evolved so dramatically. And here you see just one example. It's how mass spectrometry has evolved in, the in 20 years. And the detection limit has increased in this time frame by a factor of 10 million. So in, uh, put this, the, to put this in context, uh, in 1990, we were able to determine a certain amount of protein in a glass of water, and 20 years later, we could detect uh, the same amount of protein in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. 
So this enables us to look at those molecules and characterize them uh, that we can make by similar products. So in the end, the biosimilar must match the originate in all relevant features, like primary structure, high order structure, glycosylation, and so on. We also test the biological activities, where we have nowadays very precise bioassays available. And uh, altogether, we, when we do a biosimilar monoclonal antibody development, we use more than 40 different analytical methodologies, and uh, we analyze more than 100 different uh, structural features of the molecule. So just to give an uh, impression about the, the, the database you're using here. And here, uh, has some, here are some data, uh, how we demonstrate that the amino acid sequence is the same. And we analyze, uh, we use here a method called peptide mapping, and it works that we cut the protein into smaller pieces and separate them by chromatography. And here you see the different chromatograms of the GP2 uh, 2015 and the um, originator sourced in Europe and in the US. And you see here already visually that those patterns match quite nicely. But in addition, we also analyze each peak you see here by mass spectrometry. And by this, we can analyze the exact amino acid sequence. So by this, we, can, um, we have confirmed experimentally that the amino acid sequence of GP2015 is truly the same as the originator. Then higher order structure, folding, is also an important feature which we measure by different uh, methods. And one of those methods is X-ray crystallography. And uh, here we uh, crystallize the etanercept uh, ligand binding domain bound already to the TNF alpha. So we also check the binding to the TNF alpha you see here in green, etanercept in blue. And by this we can measure the um, three-dimensional structure down to the atomic resolution. And on the left side, GP2015, on the right side, Embrel. And you see here, this, this is a perfect match. So we have truly the same uh, higher order structure, which is important to elicit the same function. And um, the last data slide is here showing the um, results from um, the in vitro assay uh, characterization. TNF-alpha neutralization is the main mode of action, and we use uh, also cell-based biopsy to determine this. And what you see here is the variability in bioactivity of uh, different batches. In the top row, you see different batches of uh, Embrel sourced in Europe. The middle one is um, the data for Embrel sourced in the United States. And in blue, these are the data for our GP2015. And so what you see here is, beside the variability of this feature, uh, that the uh, GP2015 batch results lies, lie neatly within the middle of the total range of the reference product. So functionally, GP2015 is indistinguishable from Embrel. And this leads me now to my conclusion, uh, re-emphasizing that biosimilarity is established by following a stringent regulatory uh, biosimilar pathway and that physicians and patients can expect the same clinical efficacy and safety profile. And extrapolation is done and evaluated individually, case by, uh, for, for each and every indication. And this is also a concept which has also been used a little bit more hidden or not so public in, um, for when manufacturing process changes have been regulated. And now we are in the nice situation that we can look back at 10 years of clinical experiences by similar products on the market, which demonstrate that this concept is working and the product behave as they should be. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would like to hand over to Sasha Gattis.